Let's see. Okay, well, let's uh, get started. And uh, we'll get started in the usual way. First, by adjusting our first by adjusting our camera. <laughs> it's a little bit anyway. Um, and then <laughs> adjust our motivation. So please, thinking uh, on this occasion that the purpose of my life is to benefit all sending beings. And in particular, in order that I may be able to uh, benefit sending beings in the best way, I must uh, first <clears throat> actualize the state of my highest potential, that of complete enlightenment. And then and only then will I have all of the skills, <clears throat> qualities, and um, yeah, skillful means to guide sending beings most effectively from the oceans of samsaric suffering to the state of enlightenment. And therefore, I need to learn about all these stages of practice that lead to enlightenment. And therefore, I'm going to engage in this Lamarim teaching here today. Uh, yeah. And then... Sorry, just getting the refuge verse here. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm continuing on with the refuge and bodhicitta. I take refuge until I'm lightened Buddha Dharma and assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, so oops. Okay. So okay. So here we are. Discovering Buddhism, Module 9, Samsara Nirvana. So this is a section, uh, session six. And uh, this will be the, the last lecture. And then the following two weeks, we will have the uh, kind of dedicated uh, practice sessions where we'll do the uh, meditations uh, associated with the various uh, you know, types of suffering and um, afflictions and all that that we covered uh, in this module. So uh, let's uh, just, uh, again, further bolster our motivation. I came across this quotation, <clears throat> um, yeah, preparing for, for the session. So Dharmakirti in the Pramanavartika, uh, he says, not led by some other living being, you try to uh, rid yourself of suffering and attain happiness through your attachment to yourself. By this, you take rebirth or take birth in this inferior place <clears throat> so yeah uh this inferior place is a uh, samsara which is characterized by the uh, various types of uh, suffering and um yeah unpleasantness unsatisfactoriness uh that we've uh, you know gone over in previous sessions and so um yeah similarly uh you know mm. Shandideva, he, he, he says in the first chapter of Bodhisattva Charvatara, you know, though, though, uh, though sending beings uh, wish to uh, avoid suffering, they run towards its causes. And uh, though sending beings um, uh, wish to attain happiness, uh, they destroy its causes uh, as if it were an enemy. So uh, the question then becomes, well, why, why are we um, uh, suffering and, and why don't we attain 
the happiness that we uh, so desperately have been seeking. Well, here Dharmakirti is saying it's not uh, led by some other living being. <clears throat> so like a, an external uh, you know, enemy or even um, a god or, or someone else uh, that is causes us, causing us to suffer, uh, but rather uh, our method uh, to try to uh, get rid ourselves of suffering and attain happiness, uh, we're doing that all uh, under the, the power of this attachment uh, to yourself means this uh, false view of the I. And um, uh, through that, uh, as we had sort of identified the root cause of samsara is this uh, grasping to a uh, distorted view of the self. And then through that, uh, we take a rebirth. And then uh, as long as we're taking rebirth within samsara, then we have all of these various types of uh, suffering experiences. Yeah. <laughs> So now uh, let us, um, always keeping these in mind, right? The, the topics we're supposed to be covering. And um, at this point, we have gone through uh, meaning of renunciation, Four Noble Truths, Truth of Suffering, Truth of the Cause of Suffering, differences between Nirvana and Enlightenment. <clears throat> and now in this uh, class, I hope to uh, go through the uh, so-called Wheel of Life, uh, the 12 links of interdependent origination and then uh, the three higher trainings is left over. Mm -hmm. So now to just link that to uh, some of the uh, Lamarim outlines, right? Uh, this is from Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand. And uh, if you just you know, look at, at this one, right? This, so the way one is conceived and reborn. In that, uh, the second to the last uh, little bullet point, right? That is where the 12 links of dependent origination are. And then actually ascertaining the nature of the path leading to liberation, that is going to be the three higher trainings, right? So everything before, meaning of renunciation, oops, meaning of renunciation, and then, you know, the uh, yeah, general sufferings of samsara, specific sufferings, all of that, uh, you know, we've covered. So we just have these two left over. Um, and then uh, just to kind of compare uh, in the um, Larmarim Chenmo, L-R-C-M, then um, they have, uh, you know, the method for developing mind intent on liberation. Uh, in other words, renunciation. They had the the reflection through the four noble truths, particularly suffering and its origin. We reflect on the the drawbacks, the mechanisms of a samsara, right? And then we have the reflection from the viewpoint of the twelve dependent arisings, or the twelve links of interdependent origination. However, is translated, and in that we have the of the factors, the number of lifetimes required to complete all twelve factors, and how their significance is summarized. So, uh, Lamrim Chemo actually has a little bit, um, yeah, more more detail in terms of the the outlines which it this, it uh, describes these twelve links. Uh, in any case. Uh, this teaching on the 12 links is, uh, you know, something that comes up uh, again and again. Uh, we just have uh, one class here. So uh, let's see how much we can do. <clears throat> but first, um, yeah, we can just kind of name them. Oh, you know what? Yeah, okay, well, we'll just name them. Uh, so we have ignorance, compositional factors, conscious name form, six senses, contact feeling. Craving, grasping, becoming, rebirth, aging, and death. And probably what we've done in the past few sessions, which I like, let's just uh, take the relevant section from, oops, liberation of the palm of your hand and uh, go through that, right? Mm. 
Yeah. And then later, we'll go through um, some some parts of Lamin Chenmo. Okay. So this is where we we left off last time, right? Hmm. Right. Okay. I think I went over this last time, but um. So this previous heading, right? Thinking about the source of suffering, the entry to samsara, right? Um, that follows these other Lamrim texts, medium stages of path, swift path, and easy path. Okay, but then as we we um, as we mentioned, so we can either generate this mind of renunciation through thinking about the four noble truths. But now, uh, Popo Grimshay is saying, I shall now discuss this heading. Uh, according to the 12 interdependent links, which are also discussed in the great stages of the path or Lamrim Chenmo. So these other texts, the swift path and easy path uh, are not clear on this topic. Um, so that means, you know, they, it, doesn't, it doesn't go into detail in the, the 12 links. Um, so Pumogar Rinpoche says here, he will teach according to its treatment in Manjushri's own words, right? Jampel uh, Shelun, giving little more than its headings. Okay. So we just saw uh, the Lamrim Chenmo has those four additional headings. Um, but here in Liberation of Pamihan, it doesn't go into that. <clears throat> okay. So uh, the above brief version of the way to think about the entry to samsara, that is the source of suffering, is sufficient. Okay. So then the question comes, well, these other texts, Swift Path and Easy Path, uh, is, it a, a, is it a fault that it doesn't go into the 12 links? Well, no, it's sufficient. But um, <clears throat> people who, for example, have studied the classical debate text, however, should think about this starting with the 12 interdependent links. This is the best thing for certain exceptional people. Right? So these, uh, you know, the presentation on the, the 12 links of interdependent origination, it, uh, you know, gives uh, more, more detail. So for uh, exceptional people, uh, means, you know, uh, beings with a little bit uh, sharper faculties, maybe beings who have studied uh, more extensively, then uh, to meditate and to reflect on the, the 12 links is uh, going to be mm, sort of more, mm, more forceful, more mm, moving. Uh, to the mind. Uh, and then there's this, uh, yeah, this mention of the drawing of the wheel of life, which we'll get into uh, in a bit. But um, in any case, there was this king of uh, Magda, uh, Magda, and um, uh, yeah, Anyway, there were, uh, I think the story goes, there was actually uh, two kings and um, one of them, hmm. right, 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 yeah. The king of Magadha and this king, the foreign king, Utrayana, right? And I believe how it went was uh, Utrayana gave a very, um, Hmm. One of the kings gave the other one a very precious gift. And uh, it like, yeah, it couldn't be topped, right? So I think hmm, Uttarayana gave the king of Magadha a very precious gift. And it was so unique, so wonderful. That the king of Magadha um you know didn't they on a consultation <clears throat> uh how uh you know to to draw this painting um of, of the wheel of life and give that back to the king and um then uh right so then he gifted this uh painting of the wheel of life uh, to the other king, and the king, uh, you know, was very, very impressed, 
and then yeah developed this weariness of uh, samsara <clears throat> so anyway uh, so you should think further about the drawbacks of the origin of suffering and the drawbacks of samsara by means of the 12 interdependent links in order to strengthen your weariness of samsara and so this has its uh, source in the rice seedling sutra and in that it says because this exists that will occur because this has arisen that will arise similarly because of ignorance the compositional factors and you know mm, consciousness and, uh, in form so on all those uh, will exist right okay so let's go through so here in in liberation of palm hand it does give a you know good enough kind of <clears throat> explanation description of of the 12 <clears throat> so first is ignorance um, there are different ways to order them in, in terms of sequence but this is the kind of uh, you know traditional order with uh, ignorance first and later we'll we'll talk about different ways of classifying them. <clears throat> so ignorance. This is the root of our going around in samsara. We're ignorant of how to apprehend selflessness with our wisdom uh, when we perceive can be established by their nature. <clears throat> So ignorance is our perverse manner of apprehension that contradicts the cognition of prim primal wisdom. <laughs> this is like being uh, benighted and blind. So, um, right, this, <laughs> this sentence has a lot of, uh, you know, kind of big words, but what that means is, right, um, the cognition of primal wisdom, so primal wisdom here, yeshe, right, yeshe, and um, so yeshe, um, or primal wisdom, that is the one that um, realizes the true nature of phenomena, the, the fact that um, phenomena lack uh, this uh, inherent existence, okay? But the ignorance engages the object in a perverse manner that is directly uh, contrary to uh, primal wisdom and what it realizes, right? So mm, uh, the the ignorance, if views say, you know, ourselves or the aggregates, whatever it might be, uh, any kind of phenomena, and engages in per perverse manner, which then uh, distorts and uh, imputes, projects this mode of uh, inherent existence, right? Which is um, yeah, directly contrary to the way things actually exist, right? That they don't have inherent existence, okay? So that's what that means. Uh, then there's a statement, there are two forms of ignorance, ignorance of cause and effect and of suchness. So, um, yeah, the, uh, according to uh, Sarah J, right, our textbook, <clears throat> right, this ignorance of cause and effect actually um, isn't the, the ignorance that is described in the first link, but is talking more generally about the, the main uh, uh, two uh, kinds of ignorance that there can be. Uh, later, I think it's in, I think it's in one of the Sambas texts, there, there's a statement that, you know, through ignorance of cause and effect, then we take rebirth in the lower realms, right? And then uh, through ignorance of su uh, suchness, means the ultimate mode of reality, then we take uh, birth in samsara in general, right? So um, ignorance of cause and effect leads to uh, suffering or rebirth in the suffering realms, uh, because when we, um, you know, if we, if we truly uh, understood how um, our uh, negative actions would uh, cause us to take rebirth in the lower realm, right? then um, we would be uh, a lot more uh, precise in uh, abandoning these negative actions. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, not, nonetheless, uh, when we talk about the 12 links of uh, dependent origination, then um, the, the, the real sort of root of samsara is the ignorance of suchness. 
right? And you know, just to to lay lay the table a bit about why uh, you know Sarah J or why why we <clears throat> say that this ignorance of cause and effect isn't the actual uh, first link of dependent uh, origination, right? Uh, can anyone venture venture a guess, maybe? As uh, uh, as you say, Vanderbilt, that that uh, ignorance will not. Uh... Um, uh, lack of the, uh, the ignorance of the uh, suchness is the one that causes birth in upper realms, and that is also included in this. Of, uh, so you can uh, you can uh, be released from rebirth in the lower realms by knowing about cause and effect, but not necessarily from the upper realms. <clears throat> okay. Well, my, my, my question was, was kind of the flip side of that. The ignorance of cause and effect, is that the, um, the f counted in the first link of dependent origination? Okay, uh, words? Uh, I mean, I, I would say maybe it's too restrictive. I mean, there's the general ignorance is more comprehensive than this ignorance of cause and effect. <clears throat> okay, that, 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 that's true. Okay, well, I'll just, we'll just, we'll just jump to the chase, right? Or cut to the chase. <laughs> okay, so here, here's, here's the, the, the point, right? These 12 links of dependent origination, that's samsara, right? And uh, okay, mm, we kind of we kind of put it in this way, right? So those arhats who have attained liberation from samsara, right? They've rid themselves of <clears throat> the ignorance of suchness, right? They've rid themselves of self grasping. But as we saw from the story of Shariputra and the the old man who wished to achieve um, uh, ordination, right? he um, had a, a still a very subtle ignorance of that um, subtle karmic um, uh, seed of having uh, circumambulated the stupa that uh, served as the basis for him to be ordained, right? So that, that mind in Shariputra where he said, oh no, I don't see the, the roots of virtue for you to be ordained and then you know refused. I, I told the story, right? Uh, and then refused ordination uh, to to that um, to that older man, right? So that that is that that was a, a type of ignorance, the ignorance of cause and effect, right? The kind of the, uh, you know, the working. Of of karma, full stop, right? And then we have the um, the, the subtle subtle functionings of, of karma, right? Uh, you know, this one uh, particular, uh, you know, karmic cause leading to the, this effect, right? So uh, I guess, you know, to, to sum up, because the, that, you know, of cause and effect is in the mind stream of arhats, it can't be, uh, you know, the full, uh, you know, 12, uh, 12 links of the dependent origination because arhats will have abandoned all of samsara, right? right. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's, the, that's the reasoning we use. The other point we make, um, okay, this is actually mentioned in uh, in Lam Sankapa in the, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, hold on. Uh -huh. This is Lam channel. 
<clears throat> uh -huh, okay, here. So ignorance, uh, treasure of knowledge. It says, ignorance is like animosity and falsehood. Okay. So this, this quotation you'll see again and again, right? So here, what does that mean, right? So animosity and falsehood refer neither to the absence of friendship and truth, nor what is different from these two, but rather to the class of phenomena that are directly antithetical to and incompatible with friendship and truth. Likewise, ignorance refers uh, neither to the absence of cognition, of that cognition, which is the remedy for ignorance, nor what is other than this, but to the classes of phenomena that are directly antithetical to and incompatible with cognition. Okay. So, yeah, a little bit difficult, right? But okay, so what does this mean, right? So animosity isn't just like, oh, I'm not friends with that person, right? It's an active disliking, right? Right? Um, also, you know, falsehood um, has to be like, uh, you know, an active um, uh, lying, not just the absence of the truth, right? Mm. So similarly, uh, you know, as we were saying, a mere not knowing, right? Uh, like, for example, uh, when we say, you know, what is the, the population of Nairobi, Kenya, right? I don't know. But that's a mere uh, unknowing, right? Um, but that is not directly antithetical, right? Directly antithetical. That's what we were saying is, you know, the one we have the, the wisdom realizing emptiness or selflessness, which holds uh, correctly that uh, phenomena don't exist inherently. So directly antithetical to that would be a, a mind that holds them to be inherently existent, right? Hmm? So because of that, you see, the mere not knowing of a subtle working of uh, karma, right, isn't uh, going to be uh, the ignorance that's that's the, uh, described here. It has to be an active, uh, you know, mm, right. It's not just the absence of the cognition, but uh, which is the remedy for ignorance, but is the <clears throat> class of phenomena mm, directly antithetical to and incompatible with that cognition. You understand? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so ignorance motivates the composition of factors as if this were its job. <laughs> that gets manifest in our next reincarnation. This is the function of the composition of factors. Okay. So composition of factors is uh, basically karma, right? Okay. So here we have. Thus, we are motivated by ignorance of being blind to the law of cause and effect, thereby creating unmeritorious karma or we are motivated by the ignorance of being blind to the mode of the existence of things, and we create unmeritorious or immutable karma. <clears throat> All of these types of karma are compositional factors. Okay. So um, here, uh, right, we have ignorance. Because of ignorance, we hold on to ourself to be, you know, truly existent, right? And then based on that, um, if we are mm, sort of here, here he says, blind to the law of cause and effect, right? Then uh, we create unmeritorious karma, right? Uh, but if we are blind uh, to the mode of the existence of things, means, um, you know, selflessness, huh, unmeritorious. I think it should be meritorious, right? Right? Motivated by the ignorance of being blind to law of cause and effect, we create unmeritorious karma. 
if we are blind to the mode of the existence of things, we create meritorious or virtuous karma. Hmm. Pretty sure. Otherwise, it would, uh, you know, it, it's, it doesn't mesh here, right? We have unmeritorious here. So this should be meritorious. I'm pretty sure, right? I think so. And so what does that mean? Uh, you know, we're, we're blind to the mode of the existence of things. We don't know that, you know, um, uh, the self doesn't inherently exist, but even operating from the, the, the thought that the self inherently exists, then we think, oh, and this inherently existent self, uh, I want it to experience uh, you know, good effects in uh, the next life. And therefore, I'm going to engage in, uh, you know, virtuous karma, right? This, by the way, is the whole reason why the, the Buddha, uh, for some mm, disciples, taught the inherent existence of, uh, of the self, of the mind, right? We went over this, um, you know, the, the reason why these four uh, tenant systems came up is because for the, the, those beings, who, if they were taught the ultimate no mode of uh, reality, then they would fall into the, um, the view of nihilism, right? So for those uh, Buddha taught the inherent existence and therefore, uh, you know, motivated those people to create virtuous karma. Mm. Nonetheless, that process is still, uh, you know, in the, the, the realm of uh, samsara, right? Okay. So uh, consciousness. So here, uh, this refers to two consciousnesses. Consciousness at the type, a time of the cause and at the time of the result. Okay. So the first type is the consciousness immediately after the instinct or latency or seed of the compositional factor. That is the karma has been imprinted, right? <clears throat> so what that means is, you know, we have a, a, a karmic uh, action, and in the next moment, then that that a seed gets uh, imprinted or stored on the consciousness. So the consciousness that the imprint is stored on is the consciousness at the time of the cause. Okay. Then the second type of consciousness uh, is, is, is second type is the consciousness immediately after conception into that next incarnation. So what does that mean, right? So conception means that, that um, you know, the, the, for example, for a human, the sperm and the egg meeting, and then the uh, consciousness will go in to that uh, fertilized egg, right? And so that is the, uh, you know, at the time of the result, right? Mm. <clears throat> okay, so here's an illustration. Uh, suppose that motivated by ignorance, you take a life. When you commit this karmic, action or conventional factor its instinct or latency is imprinted as soon as the karmic process has been completed this is the consciousness at the time of the cause by virtue of this karma you are conceived into an incarnation as a hell being immediately after this conception the situation of your consciousness constitutes the consciousness at the time of the result right so we have the you know the effect is the the original karmic action its result is the the rebirth as a hell being, right? So then when our consciousness enters that hell being body, right? That consciousness is the, uh, the result, right? Consciousness at the time of the result, so, okay. Then each uh, non-virtuous karmic action is capable of throwing one into many rebirths in the lower realms. So we saw that um, the story of a monk who called another monk who is actually an arhat, he said, you jump around like a monkey, right? And uh, due to that, he was uh, reborn as a monkey 500 times. Yeah. Uh, the, in the instincts of these karmic actions enter into the consciousness as oil soaks into sand or an ink of an official seal soaks into paper. Craving and clinging are able to activate these latencies, which then become potent enough to affect rebirth. So yeah, that's what we're gonna to come to later. The process by which, you know, these karmic propensities then 
get activated and propel rebirth. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, name and form. In the case of rebirth from a womb, the name link is the four aggregates, feeling, recognition, composition of factors, and consciousness. And the form link uh, is the blood and sperm in the first stage of development, etc., into which the consciousness has been placed, right? Uh, such links, uh, where they apply, are called the link of name or form. Okay. <clears throat> so why do they say where they apply? Because a rebirth in lower realms, there's only name, but there's no form. Right. So you remember we have these five aggregates form, aggregate, and then these other four, feeling, recognition, accomplishment factors, and consciousness, right? So in the formless realm, then there's no form, it's just name. Okay? Hmm. Uh, then, the uh, six senses, once the six sense faculties, <clears throat> the eye, ear, nose, uh, tongue, body, mind are formed. Uh, this link only applies as long as one uh, still cannot discriminate between objects whenever a certain object, a faculty, and the sensory consciousness are present. Mm. The physical and mental faculties are said to exist from the period of initial fetal development. With the example of transform transformational rebirth into the, the two inferior realms, that is the desire and form realm, the name and form link and the link of the six, the six senses occur simultaneously. In the formless realm, there are only the name link and the link of the mental sense. There are no links of the form of the five physical senses. Okay. Um, so here, just, just to, to be clear, right? So for a, uh, a sense consciousness to arise, there needs to be three things. The object, <clears throat> the sense faculty, right? So let's say a physical form, right? So for an eye consciousness apprehending the cup to arise, you need the cup, you need the uh, eye sense power, as it's called, which is a subtle form within the eye, and then the, the sensory consciousness. Right. So uh, you could have the, the first two. You could have a cup and the, the, the sense faculty. Um, like right after someone dies, um, probably the, the eye is still, you know, fully functioning. That's why. Uh, you know, for uh, organ, organ donors, you know, they can, <clears throat> if you, and please do have on your driver's license, you know, organ donor, and, and they can use, use the eye. It's still uh, functioning as a, uh, you know, basis for it, for a sense consciousness to arise. However, uh, the consciousness has left the body. And so there will be uh, no, mm, uh, you know, sense consciousness, right? So you can have two of the three, but uh, even having two of the three is not enough for that sense consciousness to arise. Right? <clears throat> so then, uh, once the previous link has been formed, then the potential object, the appropriate faculty, and the appropriate sense consciousness are present and touch that is interact as well. One can then discriminate between pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral objects. This is the contact link, okay? <clears throat> so contact basically means, right, the eye consciousness coming into contact with, you know, visual forms, yeah? And then that causes these sense consciousness to arise. Then, uh, because the sense consciousness of the object arises, then feeling next. The contact link serves as a condition for the development of one of the three types of feeling, happiness, suffering, or equanimity. 
For example, we develop happy feelings on meeting with a pleasant object. So this feeling discrimination, or sorry, the, the, the feeling uh, link, right? It's talking about <clears throat> not just I feel happy, but it's, it's what we call uh, one of the, um, it's a mental factor that's omnipresent. It's always there when we have another type of consciousness. So whatever we see, there will be associated with it uh, a, a feeling uh, means happiness, suffering, or equanimity. There's only those three, right? And in general, <clears throat> when we meet with a pleasant object, we develop uh, a pleasant feeling. When we meet with an a unpleasant object, we have a, a feeling of suffering, um, gross suffering, right? And then uh, when we meet with a sort of neutral object, there still will be a, a feeling of uh, equanimity or neutral kind of feeling. Uh, okay, this is the picture. We'll get into that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so next we have craving. Craving is wanting uh, not to be separated from happy feelings. It is also wanting to be separated from suffering and clinging to the separation we can also crave that our equanimity does not decline. Feelings are said to serve as a subsidiary cause for the development of craving. This should be understood to mean that ignorance is present and that our contact then serves as a contributory, uh, contributory factor for the feelings that then occur, which in turn pr produce craving. So uh, when we do not have ignorance, though we may have feelings uh, yet, craving will not develop. Okay. So as we were saying, right, feelings, they're the mm, uh, so-called omnipresent uh, mental factor. So they're always there. But if you don't have uh, ignorance, means if you've abandoned the afflictions, although you would have a pleasant feeling, you're not going to develop uh, craving for it, right? Similarly, when you have aversion, sorry, when you have unpleasant feelings, you won't have aversion. Then we have grasping. So then it's like a little bit heightened craving, right? So our craving increases. So we desire the object and become attached to it. Uh, then we have the four types of grasping, grasping at the sensual, is being attached to the objects of the senses. Grasping at views is being attached to all evil views, except the view that it, it equates the self with the perishable. <clears throat> okay. Grasping at ethics and mode of behavior is being attached to the inferior ethics and mode of behavior linked to evil views. And grasping at assertions that there is a self is a fondness for notions of true existence. It is fundamentally a fondness for uh, the view equating the self with the perishable aggregates. Okay. Um, I think we mentioned this very briefly, right? In the, in the, root, in the discussion of the afflictions, we have the, there's six root afflictions and then 10 root afflictions. And when we have six root afflictions, then the sixth one is the, the view, right? Wrong view. And then when we expand to 10, then the wrong view we have, um, yeah, that, that is divided into five, right? So of those five views, we have this view equating the self of the perishable aggregates, right? So this is the grasping at assertions that there is the self. Then we have the, the view grasping at uh, ethics and modes of behavior as supreme. And then the other three are, right, all evil views except the view that equates the self of the perishable. So, anyway. So, next we have becoming in the past, uh, sometimes also translated as existence. In the past, compositional factors. Uh, implanted the in instinct of some karmic action into the consciousness. Craving and grasping activate this instinct, which then becomes potent enough to throw one into a body in a future rebirth. 
So, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, in brief, right? Remember we have those previously accumulated compositional factors means karma. This then implants, imprint, implants <laughs> onto the, the consciousness. Then how those, uh, if we think of those uh, karmic, we call it karmic seeds, right? How those seeds get to be activated through craving and grasping. And um, in particular, uh, toward the moment of our death, right, we have the, the uh, craving and grasping to our own existence that then activates the uh, previously accumulated karmic seed. And then it becomes potent enough to throw uh, one into a future rebirth. Then we have rebirth itself, which is um, just after, after this activation, when the now potent karma, which will be responsible for our reincarnation, serves as the basis for our being conceived in one of the four types of rebirth until uh, just after our conception into this rebirth. Okay. Uh, so what does that mean? <laughs> right. Um, this is like quite, quite quick, right? So we have a, it, like in our, in our past life, we, we had this um, becoming, right? We had the becoming means that mm, karmic imprint gets activated. It's now potent enough to throw one into a body in a future rebirth, okay? So then after that karmic seed is, is um, activated, it then throws us into another rebirth. So, so that then is, is this link of rebirth. And it, it extends so just after the conception. So just after the consciousness enters that rebirth. And then as soon as even, you know, as the, as the fertilized egg, you know, continues to divide, right? That is the process of aging, right? <laughs> even if it's, you know, one day, to two, two days, that's it's aging, right? <clears throat> aging is the maturing of the aggregates, the gradual changing of their condition. <clears throat> Death is what we call the destruction of the aggregates or their ceasing to function. Okay, so that's the kind of definition of the, those 12. And then, um, yeah, hmm. let's see. I think the, the, um, the presentation in Lamrim Chenmo is a little bit better here. So I'm gonna switch, okay? But it's going to talk about these same things, right? These, um, there's these different classifications into precipitating limb, establishing limb, resultant pre precipitating limb, and resultant manifested limb. Uh, but I want to do it on the basis of Lamrim Chenmo. Okay. <clears throat> so here it's talking about these uh, abbreviated classifications of the, the, the factors. And so a uh, compendium of knowledge written by a Sangha. <clears throat> he then, you know, uh, says, what sort of categories do you obtain by abbreviating the factors? So here, there are four types, projecting factors, projected factors, actualizing factors, and actualized factors, okay? <clears throat> so what are the projecting factors? Ignorance, compositional activity, and consciousness. Hmm. And you know how we mentioned the consciousness has two, consciousness at the time of cause, consciousness at the time of the result. So here, this is consciousness at the time of cause. <clears throat> what are the pro uh, projected factors? Then we have name and form, six sources, contact and feeling. What are the actualizing factors? 
craving, grasping, and existence? What are the actualized factors? Birth, aging, and death. Okay. So, mm. later, it's going to talk about <clears throat> how many lifetimes it takes for these, uh, all these factors to be actualized. And to understand that is actually, you know, really helpful just to know these four classifications, right? So we talked about, uh, you know, in general, projecting factors. So we have ignorance about ultimate reality. Because we have that, we uh, collect karma. That karma is then stored on the consciousness. Hmm? Okay. Now, that karmic seed then has to be activated, right? And so here we have the actualizing factors, right? So that karmic seed is activated by craving, grasping, and then existence is that karmic seed that is, you know, just about to project a, another rebirth, okay? Then, actualized factors is that that birth aging and death right so after that karmic seed is uh, you know activated it's going to project birth aging and death and then these right name form that is um referring to you know still in the womb when the uh the birth sort of takes place, right? When, when the fertilization takes place. So actually name and form and birth are simultaneous. Hmm. Right? And then we, we knew or we saw that um, after we then have the, the name and form, then through the gradual development, of the, the sense consciousnesses, right? So in the womb, right? Just just the, the, the first moment of the fertilized egg, of course, you know, doesn't have the, the eyes and, and, you know, nose, ear um, kind of mm, faculties uh, developed. <clears throat> but through that process, they, you know, eventually become developed. And then after they're developed, they can, you know, come into contact with the various objects and then when they come into contact with the various objects, then those feelings of you know, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral arise. Hmm. Okay. So this is a, yeah, this is the kind of source for that. Um, yeah. So now, you know, just for completeness, right? Uh, here, just they have a little bit different uh, vocabulary, different translation, precipitating limb, establishing limb, resultant precipitating limb, and resultant manifested limb. <clears throat> so it's, uh, here he continues, ignorance is like the sower of a seed. The karmic action, the compositional factor motivated by ignorance is like the seed. Hmm? And like the earth in which the seed is planted, the consciousness at the time of the cause has the instinct of this accumulated karma put into this. <clears throat> so the precipitating limb is the first two and a half links. Ignorance comes from factors and the consciousness at the time of the cause. Mm -hmm. Not the other division of consciousness link, the, that at the time of the result. Okay. Then, uh, just as the seed is nurtured by water, manure, heat, and moisture, so craving, grasping, activate karma, into being able to produce a result, like a seed being made potent enough by water, manure, heat, and moisture uh, to develop into a sprout. Karma that has been activated by craving and grasping is made certain to precipitate the aggregates of one next incarnation by the link of becoming, <clears throat> right? Thus, craving, grasping, and becoming are the establishing limb. So just as the sprout has uh, grown from the seed, so the link of rebirth that is being conceived into one incarnation is uh, one component of the resultant manifested limb. 
and five and a half uh, make five and a half links make up the resultant precipitated uh, limb consciousness of the time of result, which he has already discussed. Name and form were applicable, right? That means name and form in the desire and form realms. Uh, in the formless realm, it's just name. Uh, and uh, the senses, contact, and feeling. Aging and death, where they apply, are another component of the resultant manifest limb. Uh, so the resultant manifest limb is made up of the link of rebirth uh, plus that of aging death. Mm. So let's take rebirth. Uh, let us take the example of rebirth as a god through the power of our ignorance that is being blind to suchness. The in instinct of some karma we accumulated, karma that will throw us into rebirth as a god, is placed in our consciousness. Then we feel how I would welcome rebirth as a god and aspire to this in our prayers and so on. This is craving. <clears throat> and then we put more effort into increasing this aspiration. This is grasping. As at death, uh, these two make up the karma certain to throw us into this rebirth. This is becoming. So the three components of the precipitating limb and the three of the establishing limb uh, six and all are completed in this life. Then we are reborn as a God. The other six links uh, at the time of the result are completed uh, in this next re rebirth as a God. Four of them, name, form, sense, contact, feeling, are the resultant precipitating limb. And two, birth plus aging and death, are the resultant manifested limb. This is how one set of 12 links is completed in two lifetimes. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, we're gonna discuss how it takes uh, three lifetimes uh, in a little bit. Take the example of rebirth in the lower realms, same principles apply because of our blindness to cause and effect. We accumulate non-virtuous karma, which is activated by craving and grasping. Okay. It is impossible for one set of links to be completed within one lifetime. Under the power of one karmic action, the fastest is definitely two lives. Uh, why is that? Well, we know it can't uh, be completed within one lifetime because there is, uh, you know, um, craving, grasping, becoming, and then after becoming, we have uh, rebirth, right? So those necessarily uh, are, are separated. That, that's the kind of um, boundary or borderline between two, two lives. And those two can't occur in the same life, you know, becoming and rebirth. Because becoming is, is just that moment right before one takes rebirth. Yeah. <clears throat> so it takes longer when we have been able to unact, uh, unable to activate some karma through craving and grasping, then the three components of the precipitating limb will be completed in one life, the three of the establishing limb in another life, and the four of the resultant pre pre precipitating limb, as well as the two of the resultant manifested limb will uh, be completed in yet another life, taking three lifetimes at all, in all. <clears throat> in illustration, okay. Uh, let's see if this makes it more clear. In illustration, in this lifetime, we accumulate evil karma to be reborn in the lower realms, and the instinct is implanted. Okay. However, at death, the guru and others induce virtuous thoughts in us. This activates a karma for a human rebirth, and we are next reborn as a human being. When we die, uh, when we die as being a human being, we activate the previous evil karma through craving and grasping. 
and then are reborn in the lower realms. Okay, you got it? <clears throat> so then if it's three lives, in the first life, they'll just be the first three links, ignorance, compositional factors, and consciousness, okay? But, okay, so when it's, when it's two lives, then that karma that we've accumulated in this life will be activated, right? The, the, the very same karma that we've accumulated in this life gets activated at our time of death, right? So then the, the uh, craving, grasping, becoming, and the first three all come in this life, right? And then the, the name and form and the rest up to, you know, aging and death, they come in the very next life, okay? But when it takes three lifetimes, then although we've accumulated a, uh, through mm, ignorance and compositional factors, we have a, a, a seed, a karmic seed, but that one doesn't get activated at the end of this life. Instead, another karmic seed from you know previous life gets activated. And then, um, so then in, in life number two, we have uh, the craving, grasping, and becoming of the mm, craving, grasping, activating the karmic seed uh, accumulated in life one, right? And then that projects in life three, the rest of the uh, limbs. Mm. So now in our example, here, there could be many intervening rebirths between the precipitating and establishing limbs, but there are lives that belong to other sets of links and so do not count. Okay, so it means do not count in our reckoning of how many lifetimes it takes to complete these 12 links. So what does that mean? First life, we have the three, you know, ignorance, mm, uh, compositional, uh, factor and consciousness okay in uh but that uh, karmic seed doesn't get activated okay now it could even not get activated in the next life or the next life or in the next life in the next life right right so as long as that um that karmic seed isn't activated it's not being included in how many lifetimes it takes for this one set of the, the 12 links to uh, be established. It only uh, is, is going to get counted when that karmic seed of, of, of the, those 12 links is getting activated by uh, craving and grasping and then, you know, becomes becoming, right? So that'll be in life two. And then the, the rest of the six come in life three. Hmm. That's it. So to summarize, the fastest we can complete a set of links is two lives, and the slowest in three. It is not possible to do it any faster or more slowly. Right. Uh, why? Because definitely in the last life, all those six are coming together, right? So we were saying that birth and name and form are, um, you know, simultaneous, right? <clears throat> now, it could be the case that, um, yeah, uh, let's say in, in the womb, the, uh, you know, the fertilized egg, it, um, it yeah, doesn't make it, uh, to the point where the mm, sense, uh, you know, faculties are, are developed, right? Um, but nonetheless, mm, you know, those are kind of extraordinary cases. And in any case, that doesn't then mean that, um, how do you say, it's going to take more or less than, than uh, you know, two or three lifetimes. Hmm? Okay. Each link gives rise to the link that follows it. So all suffering, rebirth, aging, death, so on is, is experienced as a cycle. 
when we follow the links that resulted from a single karmic action, we may develop various other sets of links in their cause phase, right? <clears throat> so what that means is, you know, even, even in this life, right, where uh, at the last moment of our last life, we had a, a human um, karmic imprint or an imprint to be reborn as a human that was activated and we've taken re uh, more uh, karma and uh, this can set off other sets of links. Aging and death derived from rebirth, the compositional factors derived for ignorance and so on. So one link follows after another and ignorance therefore is fundamental in causing the wheel of samsara to turn. Okay. Yeah, well, okay, there's just one more page. We can go through this. <clears throat> so Nagarjuna says uh, two of them derive from the three. Seven of them derive from the two. From the seven, the three occur again. That is the way of life, and so it turns and turns. In other words, the three delusion links give rise to the two karma links. Right. Okay. So, what are the three delusion links? Ignorance, craving, and grasping. Two karma links, compositional factors, and becoming. Okay. And then from these come the seven links of suffering. So, the seven links of suffering, you know, uh, yeah, the rest, <laughs> birth aging and death, and then, you know, name form, uh, six senses, uh, contact and feeling. Hmm. Uh, so from the seven links come the three delusion links and so on, right? So from the seven links, right, we have the, you know, contact, feeling right feeling and then from the feeling of pleasant unpleasant then uh we have the the delusions of you know craving and grasping and therefore the cycle is repeated the wheel of life turns without interruption this is the revolving uh, of the wheel of suffering uh, the 12 links can be dealt with in another order if we practice a path that is able to stop them we impede the compositional factors link by preventing the ignorance link from occurring. This will put an end to all the sufferings intervening before aging and death. Okay. So means if we practice the path that is able to put a stop to them, if we realize emptiness, we prevent the ignorance link from occurring Without ignorance, then we uh, don't accumulate karma. And in that way, the, um, uh, we put an end to all of the uh, samsara process. Okay, to summarize, the 12 inter interdependent links can be brought in, uh, under three types of links. The karma links, the delusion links, and the links of suffering. Ignorance, craving, and grasping are the delusion links. The two uh, karma links are compositional factors and becoming. The remaining links are uh, the remaining links are the seven links of suffering. Yeah. So yeah. So the first uh, line of the verse discusses the three links of motivation. The second line, the two karmic links of karmic actions of body and speech. That is compositional factors in becoming and the third line, the links that one will experience. Okay. You have developed renunciation when as a result of your meditation on the general sufferings of samsara and the 12 interdependent links, you yearn to be liberated from samsara as a prisoner yearns to be freed from prison. When you develop the mind with such yearning for liberation, you will then want to train in the path leading to freedom. 
Okay. Hmm. It's a little bit, a little bit low in the frame. Okay. So here, um, you with me? Are you seeing this? This is the wheel of life, right? You see. <clears throat> so this also is uh, sort of worth uh, going over. It, um, yeah, it's nice. And this was, um, as I mentioned, the the uh, the way it's depicted here is according to those um, instructions that the the Buddha. Uh, gave right. All right, so let's go through. So here, actually, on uh, you'll, you'll you'll see a few things, right? Um, you have this outer outer limb or outer ring, right? You have this inner ring. You have this one and and you know even this okay so this outermost ring here see that these are the 12 links okay so this one i don't know oops oh yeah can you see that level of detail is it is it zoomed in now okay so here we have the uh this is actually a a blind man Right? This is ignorance. This is the, oops, hmm. uh, a potter making pots. So this is the uh, conditional factor or the karma. Sorry, I can't, I can only zoom in like that. Oh, here we go. Ah. Then uh, we have the, 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 the monkey. That's the consciousness. Sorry, one, one, one second. I'm going to look at my other commentary here. Okay. All right. Okay. And then uh, this next one, right? There's a there's a um, uh, man, right, in a boat, right? And uh, this is the the name and form, right? Means, uh, you know, like like the 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 boat is kind of like the the vessel, right? So the, the name and form is the five aggregates that, uh, you know, the, the person is, is de designated on, right? Now, the, uh, the next one is an empty house. This is the uh, six sense bases. Huh. I see. I think the significance is, um, you know, at this point, right, the, the, the six sense bases are formed, but they haven't yet uh, come into contact with the, the objects, right? That's coming next. Um, but just as the, the house that has been built, you know, is now ready to, um, you know, re receive people or, or be inhabited, right? Once these um, the six senses are uh, sort of developed, we have the, um, the the potential then to come into contact with objects, right? And that next one, uh, this couple um, doing what couples do, that is contact, right? Um, yeah. So then, uh, once we have the six um, senses uh, with uh, the objects, 
so the next is a, a person uh, who is whose eyes being pierced with an arrow, right? And uh, that is uh, feeling, right? So that's a bit bit graphic, but that just means then you know when when uh, there's there's contact, then feelings arise. In, in this case, uh, unpleasant. Okay. Then next um, is the, the the limb of craving, and here uh, the, the man. Um, it said is drinking beer, right? And when, yeah, uh, when you have one, there's some, you know, good feelings that arise maybe, and then you want to have another like that. So that's craving. And uh, then the, this one is um, the monkey plucking fruit from a tree. It's uh, grasping, right? So you, you have, uh, you know, strong uh, attachment or, uh, you know, desire for the, the fruit. So, you know, you, you climb up and uh, do things to, to get it, right? Uh, so next here, um, it is a, a pregnant woman. I'm not sure you can uh, see in the picture, but uh, in any case, this is uh, becoming becoming right so means uh just like the, the pregnant woman is about to give birth then the activated karmic imprint uh is now ready to give rise to a next birth and then uh last mm, oh sorry not not second to the last this is birth right you see the um you know woman giving birth and then um last one so this man is actually carrying a corpse on the back, and that is uh, aging and death. Okay. All right. So now the the middle, uh, sorry, going inwards. Here we have the the six realms of existence. Right? These are the, the, the gods or the, the, the uh, suras. And here are the asuras. Right? So asuras, they're constantly in war uh, with the suras, but you know, they, they lose because they are you know, not as powerful. Yeah. We have here, of course, the animal realm. Here's the the hell realm, with uh, you know beings being boiled in cauldrons, in the burning houses, um, impaled, and so forth. Here we have the hungry ghost realm. You see the you know uh, large large bellies, emaciated bodies, and the obscurations for. Um, you know, obscurations for seeing uh, water. It, when you, from a, from a distance, you see a, a river, but when you get there, it bursts into flame. Um, yeah, various external and internal uh, obscurations to seeing and uh, partaking in food. And then here is the, the human realm. So we have various worldly scenes, uh, but then here we also see the, the Lama uh, giving teachers uh, teachings to the students. So that is, um, yeah, good to keep in mind, right? The, the human realm with its, uh, you know, opportunities to uh, practice. Okay. Uh, okay, so now going even more in the center, we have, um, see this one? We have the ball side. 
and the white side being the types of beings in the in intermediate state right uh, going on from from life to life and um, in some of the texts it describes how uh, you know these beings travel they travel upside down when they're going to be reborn in uh, you know the lower realms uh, so these uh, yeah uh, Bardo being of the of the animal realm Bardo being of the uh, pretos right so the, 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 the big belly and the um, hell being Bardo being and you can see the other two uh, kind of held in the mouth, you know, showing the um, uh, where was I? Oh, do you see the share? No, right, I have to redo that. Um, sorry, where did I get cut off? The bardo being of God and uh, was I on the the inner circle. No. Okay. okay. So yeah, and then in the the center, um, we have right these three uh, animals. We have the pig, which um, symbolizes uh, ignorance. In, in that is the in the mouth right we have the poisonous snake representing uh hostility and the pigeon which uh you know represents uh, attachment so these are the so-called three poisonous minds which you know in, in turn fuel oops some samsara <clears throat> then uh, holding all of this in the mouth, right, uh, in, the, in the fangs, this is Yama, the Lord of Death, right, means wherever we are in all of samsara, we're bo uh, bound kind of under the control of uh, the Lord of Death. And then here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see, but there is this, um, this verse in Tibetan, and this actually was a, a, a verse um, um, of the Buddha, and he, he gave these instructions to right below uh, the wheel of life. And so uh, this one, um, here I'll translate it. It says, "Under taking this and leaving that, enter in uh, into the teachings of the Buddha, like an elephant in a thatched house." Uh, destroy the forces of the Lord of Death. Those who, uh, with thorough conscientiousness, practice this disciplined doctrine will forsake the wheel of birth, bringing sufferings to an end. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Undertaking this and leaving that. Uh, so you can uh, interpret that on a, a couple of uh, levels, right? Um, you can uh, think, uh, you know, on a kind of more conventional level, uh, you have to uh, undertake a virtue and abandon non-virtue. Or um, um, on a more, more deeper level, you can uh, undertake the uh, true path and true cessation and uh, abandon or leaving behind uh, true cause and uh, true suffering, right? Or, yeah, undertake the, the practices that lead to nirvana and abandon or leave behind uh, samsara and its causes. Okay. Then uh, by, by doing that, um, you know, destroying the forces of the Lord of Death, like an elephant in a, a thatched, thatched house means like a, a grass hut. Right. 
Um, then, uh, those uh, who with thorough consciousness practice this discipline doctrine will forsake the wheel of birth, bringing suffering to an end. Mm. So it's through our own uh, practice of uh, disciplining the mind, right? Uh, that we will uh, abandon all of samsara and all its associated sufferings. Okay. Great. So let's see. Oh, okay. These are the what we went over, abbreviated classification of the factors. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so that was the, the section on the uh, 12 links and the, the wheel of life. <clears throat> and then there is this uh, one remaining. Um, so here, where's the, yeah. Actually ascertaining the nature of the path leading to liberation. So this was um, just to kind of summarize the key points brought up in uh, liberation in the palm of your hand. So there's two further outlines. The sort of rebirth that will stop samsara. So in that, Geshe Potawa says, When you wandered so much in the past, samsara did not stop by itself, nor will it stop by itself. You must stop it. And the time to stop it is now that you have gained the optimum human rebirth. <clears throat> so we, um, you know, uh, mentioned this uh, many times, but, uh, you know, since uh, getting, uh, well, putting a stop to samsara means, mm, uh, attaining nirvana, <clears throat> it only is going to come through developing the wisdom realizing emptiness. And in order to do that, then uh, all these other factors need to be there. Uh, first, we need to have access to the teachings, and then we have to have the type of mind uh, that is able to grasp the teachings. And, uh, you know, that is uh, found in this optimal human rebirth with the external, uh, you know, sources uh, of the teachings and then the internal, uh, you know, factors of having intelligence, full faculties and uh, interest in the teachings, not having wrong views and so forth. So this uh, type of optimum human rebirth that we have now is uh, the very type of rebirth that, uh, you know, we can put an end to samsara, with which we can put an end to samsara. So then now, uh, the sort of path that will stop samsara, oops. Uh, then in Nagarjuna's letter to a friend, uh, he says, if your hair or clothes should suddenly catch fire, give up putting them out. Strive instead to stop reincarnation. No other aim can be as great. So I think I mentioned this. Um, yeah, in other, in other contexts. Uh, actually, Tokme Zangpo, the, the great Bodhisattva Tokme Zangpo, in his 37 practices of Bodhisattvas, you know, he mentions that uh, if, if even the uh, Arhats, um, you know, uh, strive to achieve nirvana for their own sake, as if you know, more, more urgently than uh, putting out their hair uh, that has caught on fire, uh, then certainly the bodhisattvas who are striving for supreme enlightenment would, um, you know, put even more effort, right? <clears throat> so what are the things we need to then make effort in? Through pure ethics, wisdom, and concentration, achieve peaceful, subdued, stainless nirvana, a state immortal, ageless, ageless, inexhaustible, beyond earth, water, fire, wind, sun, and moon. Okay. So this then is the three higher trainings uh, that we had mentioned, right? We have the higher training in ethics, wisdom, and concentration, All right? And then the, the normal way, I'm going to stop the screen share.
the normal way this is discussed, right, is uh, we had mentioned many times how the actual antidote to samsara is the wisdom realizing emptiness, uh, but <clears throat> it's not just some uh, conceptual realization, but it has to be a, a direct realization. And um, although that is the case, when we first realize emptiness, we must necessarily do it uh, on a conceptual level. But through repeated uh, familiarization and meditation, then our um, conceptual understanding will uh, be upgraded, will we'll switch, will transform into a direct realization. Um, and in order for that to happen, then we need meditative concentration. So there is this uh, analogy uh, in the text of someone going into uh, like a, a dark room or a kind of cavern where there are wall murals, paintings on the wall, right? So uh, as long as it's dark, you can't see the, the mural. Even if you have a candle, if it's windy, and the candle is flickering so much, then uh, you know the walls still are unclear. So, if wisdom is uh, like the the light which illuminates, then having on the candle a kind of wind screen is like having uh, concentration. Then, based on the the single pointed concentration that's able to, uh, you know clearly and penetratively focus on one object for as long as uh, one wish wishes, then <clears throat> um, that repeated uh, process of single point of concentration on emptiness, uh, then will uh, is what is going to allow us to mm, yeah, upgrade the understanding to a training on concentration. Uh, then the foundation uh, of all of that, because, well, uh, I'm not sure I mentioned before, but uh, on one level, right, then in order to achieve concentration, you know, we have those two um, obstacles that we're dealing with the excitement and laxity, right? Those of you who've received teachings on how to attain shamatha will know those, right? So excitement is this uh, factor of the mind that is being distracted by, drawn away from uh, the object of meditation to pleasant objects, right? And then laxity is this uh, kind of lethargic mind that lacks clarity. Mm. Okay, then the antidote to those is uh, mindfulness and introspection, right? So mindfulness is the, the faculty of the mind that holds the, the object and knows when the laxity and excitement are arising. Okay. So one thing I've heard is through the, 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 the training and, and keeping ethical discipline, actually, uh, the, the type of, of vigilance that we do in our um, daily life, right, where, um, as Shanti Deva says, you know, all day and night, we examine the, the state of our mind. Mm -hmm. So that actually is uh, uh, a way to train the uh, you know, vigilance, the introspection that we then use in our meditation practice, right? We're not just doing things sort of mindlessly. We're not letting our minds roam around everywhere, but instead we keep our mind, uh, you know, uh, sort of concentrated on what we're doing with our, our body and our speech hmm? and having that level of introspection, then it uh, serves as a, a, a training, a, um, yeah, a, a skillful way to uh, increase 
the uh, introspection on the meditation cushion. Um, so that's one. And then uh, I guess more broadly speaking, um, hmm. there's this uh, quotation from the sutras saying that ethical discipline is um, for the sake of freedom from remorse and um, I'm not sure I mentioned this to you, but in, in my own uh, brief meditation experience, uh, the first time I did a long or like a concentrated intense retreat, you try to sit down and uh, you know, focus on various whatever, the breath or whatever you want to do. Um, I, my first retreat was Vipassana, right? And then you try to focus, but actually all these other memories come up. And in the first uh, retreat, then uh, I was remembering a lot about uh, people who would harm me, you know, and then actually getting upset at them and thinking about, you know, what I should have said in that time, in that moment, right? <laughs> anyway, the second retreat, it was interesting because I, I then remembered all of the people that I had harmed and, uh, you know, came to feel really bad about um, some of the things I had done. So all of that actually um, was kind of predicated on my own uh, lack of ethical discipline, right? And all those times I had harmed others. Right. So here in that 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 sutra where it says are freedom from remorse. Uh, right. And then more broadly speaking, when we think about the um, the higher training and ethical discipline, its importance. Well, it's also because, uh, unfortunately, most of us were probably not going to get liberated in this lifetime. And so we need that string of uh, uh, good rebirths, precious human rebirths, where we have uh, a good opportunity to, to practice. So that is the uh, three higher trainings. And... Yeah, well, let's just, I'm actually ahead of time. I had a schedule for once. <clears throat> so let's just see uh, if there's anything else we need to comment on from uh, Pobonk Rinpoche, and then I'll open up for questions for, uh, from you. Yeah, so we had these two, right? This, this sort of rebirth that will stop samsara and the sort of path that will stop samsara. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here in, in this text, the, the, he gives a, a, a different analogy as well, right? Um, uh, if you want to chop, chop a tree, you need a, a sharp axe and a steady arm. If it isn't sharp, you can't cut. You cannot cut the tree trunk. If the if the arm is unsteady, the axe will not fall in the same place on the trunk. Right, and then this mural at night. Uh, okay, so you know in both this text and um, Liberty, uh, sorry, uh, Lamrim Chenmo, then. Um, the, the authors, they, they use it to sort of extol the virtues of living an ethical lifestyle. And um, I think part of that, hmm, is because remember in the time of uh, Atisha, there had been a decline of the Dharma and then different wrong views had come up. 
about, um, well, the need to practice the, the Pratimoksha vows if one has Bodhisattva or, or Tantric vows and all that. And so um, it was uh, Atisha who, uh, one of his main projects was to show uh, how these three types of uh, morality or the three types of vows are, uh, you know, consistent with each other. And then later, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa. So why the, the tradition uh, sort of founded by Tsongkhapa is called the Gelukpa. Uh, so Ge is virtue and Luk is tradition. So it's the, the kind of virtue, virtuous tradition uh, because of the, the emphasis that Lama Tsongkhapa put on uh, guarding pure morality. So anyway, that's that. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Um, I have a question about the 12 links. And uh, I mean, you talked about the, the karma that gets activated at the time of death, basically, that's, that mm -hmm. throws you into your next lifetime. And that's kind of like one karmic seed that gets activated at that time. But during our lifetime, we create so many karmic seeds, like every day, thousands, I suppose. So, but only one of them gets activated at the end. So isn't there some kind of imbalance that we accumulate so much karma, but only one of those really, you know, propels us to the next rebirth. And then again, the same kind of imbalance happens that we just accumulate karma and there's never a chance to, for all this karma to ripen in some sense. Right. So, um, yeah, this is a, a good question. Um, so now, re remember, there is that section on, uh, I think it was in, hmm, yeah, to, uh, the beginning of it talks about uh, the actual process to get uh, liberated, right? And so although there are the two causes of samsara, karma and afflictions, the primary one is the afflictions, right? Because actually, um, you know, we were saying that karmic imprint is going to get activated by craving grasping at the time of death, right? So even the arhats who have attained liberation in this life, they have countless, like, unbelievably many um, karmic imprints still in their continuum, right? But because the craving and grasping aren't there, those karmic um, imprints don't get activated. Hmm. Let me try to find this in. Uh, let me try to find this. Uh, you understand? Yes. So it is true that we have so many uh, karmic rebirth, uh, sorry, karmic imprints. Um, and uh, we're not going to purify them all, right? And we don't need to purify them all. All we have to do is get rid of the uh, afflictions. And then, uh, okay, here, we're getting close. Uh, boy. Okay. All right. right, 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 right. Okay. See? Dharma Kirti in Compendium of Valid Cognition, Pramanavartika, right? Says the karma of one who is transcended craving for existence lacks the potency to project another birth because its cooperating conditions are gone, right? Mm -hmm. So that means one who has abandoned the afflictions, they still have karma, but that karmic, those karmic seeds lack potency, lack the potential to project another rebirth because the cooperating conditions of craving and grasping are gone, right? So anyway, just, just as a seed without moisture, soil, etc., will not produce a sprout. So in the absence of the afflictions, even though you have accumulated immeasurable karma in the past, there'll be no sprout of suffering because the karma lacks 
the necessary cooperating conditions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so now the question becomes, well, uh, if that's the case, well, why are we talking about you know the need to purify our, our negative karma so much? All right. All right. And so here, um, well, remember the two things. One is probably we're not going to realize emptiness in this life. So we need to uh, make sure with most urgency that we get a good rebirth in our next life. But uh, aside from that, you know, uh, one of the other uh, things, and this is why Lama Sankaba, you remember from his, his own life story, he spent all those years doing uh, prostration, mandala offering, so forth. Because, you know, every kind of success is the ripening of virtuous karma. And even these, uh, you know, negative karmic imprints, yes, they project a rebirth in the lower realms, but they also block our realization, right? So as long as we have, you know, these, the more negative karmic imprints we have on our mental continuum, that is going to cause obstacles uh, for our practice. And that's going to prevent us from achieving, uh, you know, realizations. So uh, that's why these preliminary practices are so much emphasized we purify our negative karma, we thin out the karmic obscurations to the point where once they you know, become sufficiently low, then if it's supported by a lot of merit, then when we meditate, we can kind of punch through and have that breakthrough uh, you know, realization of, of emptiness or, or bodhicitta or what have you. Okay. Okay, uh, something else? Okay. I don't oh, have a question, yeah. but I have a request. Earlier, okay. in at the beginning of the module, you were sending your slides, and particularly the ones that are on uh, Flint, Lam Room Chen Mo, which we, we may not have, mm. that would be helpful if you've updated them for the last couple of sessions. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes, I will I will I will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, um, I have a couple more minutes and uh, you know, maybe I'll share something and then we can dedicate. But um, we talked about this before and this is the kind of the, the, the critical point about understanding why uh, the sort of need uh, and purpose of developing this mind of renunciation. And um, yeah, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in the context of, you know, whether uh, Buddhism is a pessimistic view, and we talked about uh, why uh, of the four and all the truths, the truth of suffering is, uh, you know, discussed first and all that. But in my own contemplation, I kind of uh, came up with a, a kind of analogy that... Um, this is a bit helpful for my mind. I wanted to just share it because we have a few extra minutes. Um, so you can imagine. <laughs> all right. So where I went to school. Okay. Or I went to university. Um, Princeton, there's this uh, sh street. It's called The Street. And on it, you know, there's all these, uh, they call them eating clubs, right? And they, they're all in a row. It's like, uh, you know, some universities have like fraternity row, right? Right. So all these, these houses, and uh, sorry, I don't know if there's an equivalent in, you know, because I recognize there's some non-Americans here. But anyway, you can think it's a kind of concentrated place where all these parties are happening, you know, next door to each other. And invariably, you know, you go to one party, and, uh, you know, some of them, they're just not that fun, right? 
Uh, so then you, you recognize the party is, is actually not fun. Um, and you think, oh, well, if I go next door, if I go next door, then that will be the, the, the fun one, right? I'll have a better time there. Okay. So uh, you have in your mind that you want to go. You're about to go. And then, you know, some other things can happen, right? Maybe your friend shows up at the party you're at, right? Maybe on the, you know, the music, like your favorite song comes on, right? Maybe, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you meet a friend and they say, oh, no, before you go, like, I don't know, let's play a game of pool, something like this. Right? So even these things happen and you're, you're like, oh, man, I was about to go all right, I'll stay for, you know, one more drink or one more game of pool or I'll, you know, chat with my friend for five more minutes, all right? So anyway, I was thinking about this and it's like, well, that's kind of what happens to us, right? At our level on, on, on the path, we have some general inkling that, uh, you know, yeah, we're in some sorrow. There's these kind of problems. But we always are like, Oh, you know what? <laughs> one more drink, one more this, one more that. We're, we're a little bit, if we're honest, how much effort we're putting into sort of leaving the party versus how much effort we're like, ah, oh, just stay for a few more minutes. It's not so bad, right? Then we see <laughs> why was, we're still here in the in the first party even we have some sense oh no it's not that good so uh you get the analogy i'm not sure it was a little bit helpful for my mind but you see you know liberation right mm. it's like so much better, you know, so it, it would be like the, the, the party next door. Okay. Imagine, you know, in, in where you are now, there's a, a jukebox and they play music, but I don't know who you like, but it's like next door, the actual band is playing, you know, but you're like, Oh, so kind of, mm, is it maybe a bit of inertia? You're just kind of staying there rather than going to this thing that's so much better, so much, you know, so much better that when you actually get there, you'll be like, oh my gosh, why didn't I, why didn't I come here earlier? <laughs> what was I doing wasting my time next door? So the Buddhas, you know, they're, they're, they're like that, right? They're, they're trying to, you know, exhort us, right? They're trying to tell about all these, these benefits of, uh, you know, leaving where you are now, samsara, and coming to that city of liberation, you know. And it's not like, you know, because sometimes this also happened, right, right. Uh, in, in, in those parties, they would have passes, right, or like, you know, the, like the, the VIP section of whatever kind of nightclub, you know, beyond the velvet ropes, right. So it could be, right, theoretically, if there is a such nicer place, but you needed the VIP pass and you didn't have one, you know, then to hear about all the fun time they're having right by, beyond that, and you don't have access, it might cause you more suffering. But here it's not like that. We all, uh, just from the fact that we have this mind, we have access to the teachings, we have all this, we have the opportunity to go to that, that better place of, of liberation. Yeah, like that. Anyway, you see, this is like what we're talking, wisdom arising from contemplation. So you might have experiences in your own life, right, where you think about it. And then, you know, 
think about these things and kind of draw the connection. Draw the connections, make it real for your own life. And uh, yeah. Mm. But that question about, oh, you know, Buddhism being pessimistic and why are we talking about suffering so much? Later, when you, if you ever have the opportunity to, to teach, or even, even now when you attend some, some courses, uh, particularly with beginners, that, that kind of comes up a lot. And so it's good to be able to say something, say something uh, to kind of address those concerns. Okay. So the next two weeks, we will have a, uh, the, the practice sessions. And uh, we'll have it at the same time. Also, we'll have a, a kind of interviews to talk about these things. And I'll send some kind of self-assessment questions to help you with your review. Okay. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. And let's just dedicate now. So may whatever virtue I've collected benefit the teachings and all transmigratory beings, and, and may it especially cause the essence of perfect, pure Lozan Dhaka's teachings to shine forever. Let's also dedicate for the long lives of the spiritual friends, for the flourishing of the Holy Dharma, and for all of these various uh, problems uh, in the world. Uh, of course, due to uh, common afflictions, but... Um, on a more sort of mm, short-term level, all the problems caused by war, uh, natural disasters, environmental degradation, uh, disease, mm, yeah, economic problems, all these things that are undesirable, may these also come to an end right away. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Venerable Lubsap. Thank you, Urs. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Venerable Namjong. Thanks, Urs. See ya. Okay. Have a good week, everyone. See you, see, see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.